Everybody, you are about to watch the Palai Bible Church program, the moment of transformation. Today, by the grace of the Lord, we shall listen to our pastor, General Superintendent, Pastor W.F. Kumoyi. We are going to be blessed. It is my wish that you call your family to come and listen to you, as our pastor is blessing you with his holiness blessing. I'm reading to you from Exodus chapter 19. I'm going to read verse 5, verse 7, verse 8. And to prepare your mind to receive what the Lord is sending to us this morning. I want you to understand that at the end of the life of Christ on earth, at the end of his ministry on earth, there was one concern that he had. He asked the question, when a son of man comes, will he find face on the earth? Come back. At the time of the age of the ministry of Moses, he also had a concern in the last days of the nation of Israel. Will they still continue in the word of God? Come on to the end of the New Testament. As Peter was about finishing his race, again he was concerned about the last days. And he said that in the last days, coffers will come. And they will toss the word of God aside. Again, it's the same concern. Will the truth remain and abide until the end? All the apostle. And that same concern that in the last days, men will heap up teachers unto themselves, having itching ears. They will depart and go away from the truth, and they'll be turned unto fables. And at such a time like that, we need to bring back the word and bring ourselves back, so to say, to Bethel. And we need to find out what's the word of God saying, and what should be your part. Your attitude to the world at such a time like this. We need to do that as individuals. We need to do that as families together. We need to do that in every local church. And we need to do that in our church, Deep Alive Bible Church. And so I'm going to examine the word of God with you this morning on renewing our commitment to God's forgotten word. Renewing a commitment to God's forgotten word. The word is still there. The Bible is there. But it's like we have forgotten. The churches are forgetting. The world is forgetting. And the Lord wants the people who are getting ready for his coming. He wants us to bring ourselves back to the foundation of where we started. Exodus chapter 19 now. I'm reading from verse 5. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then it shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people, all people, for all the earth is mine. Verse 7. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. What a faithful minister. He didn't take anything out of the words. 
diminish from the world because the people may not accept that, appreciate that, acknowledge that, love that, embrace that. But he gave all the world. Are you that faithful? If you have any chance, any opportunity to declare the word of the Lord. He gave them all these words in verse 8. And all the people without exception answered together in unity and said all that the Lord has spoken. We will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. The any attitude the Lord wants us to have to his word. That's the attitude demonstrated right there. All the words that thou hast spoken, we will do. In Exodus chapter 24, reading from verse 3. Exodus 24 verse 3. And Moses came and told the people all these words of the Lord. All the words of the Lord didn't take anything away. I we still say we are like that today in our church. If we're preachers, can we say we're still like that today? That we accept the totality of the world. We believe the entirety of the world. And we're preaching, we're disseminating, we're declaring. We're proclaiming, we're emphasizing the entirety of the word. As Moses did, he came and he told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice. That's unity again. United around the word of God. United around the revelation. Of the truth of God. And says all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Verse 7. In verse 7, and he took the book of the covenant and he read in the audience of the people. And they said all that the Lord as said, we will do and be obedient. Not just to hear, not just to learn, not just to preach it, but to do it and to be obedient. Second Kings chapter 23. In Second Kings chapter 23, here we find a good king. There were not too many of them at that time. That brought the whole people together. And it came to a renewed commitment, a renewed covenant. Second Kings chapter 23 verse 1. And the king said, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. There are times that Elders of the church need to come together, not to socialize, not to celebrate, not just to fellowship, not just to interact, but to re-examine once again. Where do we stand? In relation to the word of God, how do we stand? In relation to still believe in the word, standing on the word, be willing to be obedient to the word, that those leaders, overseers, leaders, pastors, preachers, key workers and decision makers in the body, they come together and it says, and the king went up unto the house of the Lord. And all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem were seen. And the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read 
in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. Verse 3. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and with all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. That's what he did. That's what we will do. That we will stand by this word. Whatever the church has, if we've lost the word, we've lost everything. Whatever position, whatever privilege, whatever riches, whatever popularity, whatever acceptance the church has in the world, and whatever value we may place on ourselves, was we may place on ourselves, if we have lost the word, we have lost everything. It came to that time in the land of Israel, they lost the word. They lost everything. The glory was departed from the people. The truth fell. The truth became forgotten. And so they became nothing in the sight of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 59. I'm reading from verse 14. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 14. And judgment is turned away backward. And justice standeth afar off. For truth is falling in the street. Truth is falling in the street. And equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth. And he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. It was so strange to the children of Israel that anybody will repent. That anybody will turn away from sin, turn away from error. Yes, they still kept religion. They still kept a form of worship. As if they were seeking the Lord. But then, he that departed from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. It's in the light of all the scriptures and many more that we come to consider in the word of God today how we need to recommit ourselves and reconsecrate ourselves and rededicate ourselves to God's forgotten word. There are three things we're going to look at. Number one, the revelation of God's faithful word. The revelation of God's faithful word. What word are we talking about? And what has God revealed in his word that we need to faithfully keep to? The revelation of God's faithful word. Number two, the result of God's forgotten word. When that word is forgotten, when we allow it to fall to the ground, when we just take the shell of worship, the shallowness of fellowship, and the sentimentality of the milk of human love. But the real substance and the real word of God that grants us life eternal. That grants us the life of Christ here on earth. When that word is lost, the rest is worthless and useless. The result of God's forgotten word. Number three, our recommitment to God's final word. Our recommitment to God's final word. Number one. What's number one again? The revelation of God's faithful word. God is a faithful word. God. And his word must remain. And that word remains forever. He doesn't uh, say this now and change after a few 
years, after 40 years, after 50 years, and say, well, I don't think I demand that of you, of anyone, anymore. Titus chapter 1, verse 9. In Titus chapter 1, verse 9. It says in verse 9, holding forth the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. This is talking about the minister. This is talking about what that is called. Called to declare to people how to turn away from their sin and to turn unto the Lord. How to turn away from the world and turn unto the Lord. How to turn away from darkness and turn to the light. It says such a minister must have the word in him. Such a minister must have that faithful word. And he must be faithful to that word because it is the word of God. Then he calls that same faithful word, he calls it sound doctrine. It is the doctrine of salvation by grace. It is the doctrine of repentance before you can have real truthful righteousness. It is the doctrine of the new birth, sound doctrine. It is the doctrine of a new life. Any man being Christ, a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Not that now we have become Christians, everything is now all right. Our sins are forgiven. We now have license to continue living in sin. Sin no more, lest a worse thing happen or come unto you. The sound word of holiness and sanctification, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And Jesus, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, he suffered without the gate. Let us go for us, therefore, without outside the gate, bearing his reproach. It is the word that is complete. One man, one wife, until death do you part. And then the word of his coming again is the faithful word. The word he has given out and then he doesn't change that word because it's what remains. His word abides forever. If we were to break it down, the faithful word that the Lord has revealed unto us, how would you describe that? Let me show you a few things about that faithful word. We're looking at John chapter 8 verse 68. John chapter 8, verse 68. It says in verse 68, Then Peter, Simon Peter, answer, answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. That's the faithful word. Thou hast the words of eternal life. If our preaching doesn't ever talk about eternal life, about living with God in heaven, about repentance. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, eternal life. If we never preach the word of eternal life and how to have the eternal life, how to abide in that eternal life, we're not faithful to the faithful word but is the word of life eternal. Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 26, Acts chapter 13, verse 26, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you fearest God to you is the word of the salvation saint, the word of salvation. If we don't talk about salvation, if all we're talking about now, we just study the scriptures and be a good person, be a nice person, be a loving person, a lovable person, and be a good fellow. If that's all we're talking about now, and the salvation of the Lord, the purpose why Jesus came to this world, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. For the Son of Man, the Son of God, cometh not to condemn the world, but to save. He came to save. 
for this purpose the Son of Man and the Son of God was manifested that he will take the sinner out of sin and then he'll bring him into the kingdom. You remember what John said? What John said about Jesus the next day? He says, Jesus coming and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. That's why he came, and that's why we preach this word of salvation. The question is, are you saved? Saved from sin? Are you saved? Saved from sinning? Are you saved? Are you saved from sale? Are you saved? Are you saved from all the practices of society? As that new life, eternal life, the word of salvation, as it taking root and effect in you. Because if you have not been saved, all else is worthless religion. In Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, I'm reading here from verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Number one is a word of eternal life. Number two is a word of salvation. Acts of the Apostles, I'm looking at verse chapter 20, verse 32. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. And we're reading from verse 32. Acts 20, 32. The revelation of God's faithful Word. It says in verse 32, now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. That's a faithful word. It's the word of his grace. But it's not um, the word of a graceless life. No. But it says the word of his grace. What does that word of his grace, what does it bring? What does it, what does it do? What does it achieve in our lives? What kind of life does that word of grace grant unto you? Grant unto me, Titus chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 11. When you hear that word of grace, it transforms your life. It changes your life. It turns you around. That what you were, you are no more. The darkness in your life in the past, that darkness is no more there. That's grace. The grace that transforms. The grace that changes you. And the grace that makes you triumphant over the temptations of the past. Of the past. In uh, Titus chapter 2 verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation. Grace does not bring more sin into our lives. It brings salvation. Grace does not bring degradation into our lives. It brings salvation. Grace does not bring license and liberty to keep on sinning. Grace brings salvation. And the word of His grace, that's a faithful word, is the word of eternal life. It is the word of salvation, and it is the word of His grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying of godliness and worldly lusts, we should live how do we live? Frivolously. How do we live? Carelessly. You know, there are people that say, Well, I'm living in grace. And they're frivolous and careless and carefree. Their lives, there's no control. There's no personal self discipline. You say, my friend, but you say you are born again. Hey, yes, I'm born again. And that's what makes me free. I'm at liberty to do and say anything. You miss the point. It teaches us that denying of godliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly when. In this present world, looking for, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Why? 
that she might redeem us from some of our iniquities. From what? From all iniquity. You better believe it that when you are born again, he doesn't uh, expect you to still keep some of your old sins. It changes your life. It transforms your life. It makes you a totally new creature. Because that's the salvation. If it's your own salvation you produce by yourself, you'll conquer some sins and the other sins will remain. If it is salvation of the Lord that he gave, he gives you that salvation and he takes the power of sin. He breaks the power of sin away from your life. And he says, he gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity and to purify. That's in the Bible, purify. There's purity in the Bible. There is sanctification in the Bible. There is holiness in the Bible. There is this purification of your heart, purification of your mind, purification of your thoughts, to purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. I pray it will happen. And I pray that for those who have got it, it will be permanent in Jesus' name. Is the word of eternal life. It's the word of his grace. It's the word of salvation. And it is the word that makes us remain in that righteousness and holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. In Colossians chapter 3, reading from verse 16, here it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. What's the faithful word? Is the word of Christ. Everything Jesus spoke, everything Jesus said, everything Jesus commanded. He said, When you keep my word and you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ and then relegate the word of Christ to the background. And leave us if Jesus never said anything. Look at the words of Jesus. He spoke about everything concerning our, our lives. He spoke about righteousness. He spoke about repentance. Except she repented, she shall likewise perish. He spoke about restitution. Make right your lives. Clean up your lives. And have a heart, a conscience void of offense towards God and towards man. He spoke about marriage. Spoke about forgiveness. He spoke about love. The love of God in your heart. The number one thing. And he spoke about the love of Christ. That you love your brother, you love your sister as I, Christ, as I have loved you. And he spoke about your neighbor, loving your neighbor as yourself. He spoke about his coming again. He spoke about enduring to the very end. He spoke about uh, conditional security. And he says over here, let the words of Christ abide in you and dwell in you and remain in you. And function within you. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Not the wisdom of the world. Not the wisdom that teaches you how to commit sin and hide it very well. But in all the wisdom of God teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do, this result, this is the consequence, and this is the outcome, this is the fruit, this is the product of that word of Christ abiding in you. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Look at verse 23. When that word of God abides in you, whatsoever ye do, do it heartily with all your heart as to the Lord and not unto men. It tells us in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. How the word of God, this word revealed word, faithful word, 
is regulate all our lives, affect all our lives, influence all our lives, infiltrate all our lives, and is to, what, to live by that what it says in verse 4, Matthew chapter 4. And he answered and said unto and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. You notice that? That's the word of Jesus by every word. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Why don't you subtract and add and just do whatever we want with the word of God? Why don't you live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord? The revelation of God's faithful word. Unfortunately, that word has been forgotten in many circles. The word of salvation, the word of righteousness, the word of truth, the word that prepares us from us here, getting us ready for heaven. That word has been forgotten in many circles. What's the result of that? Number two now, the result of God's forgotten word. In your personal life, when you forget the word, what happens? In your family, when you forget the word, or just live by whatever comes to your mind, how you feel, how you think, and you just act by what you see in the papers, what they watch over the television, what they hear over the radio, you just act what you see your neighbors doing because you're forgotten the word. And you have taken the word, you have relegated the word to the background. What's the result of that point? Number two, the result of God's forgotten word. I'm looking at Second Chronicles chapter 15. Second Chronicles chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 3. It says, now for a long season, Israel has been without the true God. And without a teaching priest. And without law. Without the law of God, without the word, without a teaching priest, priests were there. The social priests were there. The priests, the sugar daddies, they were all there. The people that never corrected anything, corrected anybody, they were still there. The people that just worshipped and worshipped and worshipped, but the teaching is no more there. And that's what the people love. Don't teach us, just love us. Don't teach us, just fellowship with us. Don't teach us, just encourage us. Don't teach us, just acknowledge us. Don't teach us, just honor us. Don't teach us, just appreciate us. We need self-esteem. We need encouragement. And when there is no teaching priest, when there is no law, when there is no truth, You'll be without the true God. It is the truth of the word that links us with God. The truth of salvation and the truth of sanctification and the truth of holiness. That's what links us to the holy God. But it says now for a long time, Israel has been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without the law. Look at verse, uh, look at verse 5. And in those days, in those times, there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in. But great vexation, what vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. A nation was destroyed of nation, and city of city, for God did vex them with all adversity. That, that's what happens. There will be adversity, there will be sickness, there will be affliction, there will be oppression, and there will be violence, there will be a lot of negative, devilish things going on because we do not have the teaching priests, we do not have the law of God, we do not have even the true God. In Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah chapter 59, what happens when the word of God is forgotten? When the word of God is tossed aside, when the word of God, even though the people say they're still worshiping God, and they say they still love God, they are fasting, they are praying, and they're doing all those uh, religious things, but 
the truth of the word of God is not there. Isaiah chapter 59, I'm reading here from verse 14, and judgment is turned away backwards, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is falling in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departed from evil maketh himself a prey, and the Lord saw it, and it displeased him, and that there was no judgment. Look at Isaiah chapter 30. When the truth is forgotten, maybe there are still a few people wanting to preach the word of God. Maybe there are still a few people wanting to emphasize that if you're going to have any relationship with God, you must start with repentance. And if your life has been all wrong and upside down, you've been a thief and, you know, you've been here and there, you restore what you have stolen. There's restitution that the Lord has taught. You become right with God. You become right with man. And maybe there are still a few people able to preach the word of God and they say it convincingly. But look at the attitude of the people when that truth is forgotten and nobody wants that truth back again i'm reading from verse 9 of isaiah chapter 30 isaiah chapter 30 verse 9 that this is a rebellious people lying children children that will not hear the law of the lord then there are people that they, they love church but they don't love the word they love worship they don't love the word they love whatever it is you are doing in the assembly, in the fellowship, in whatever it is. But as to the word, they will not hear the law of the Lord. They can dance for hours. They are worshiping the Lord. But when the word of God comes, if it calls them to correction, if it calls them to holiness, if it challenges them and challenges their lives and tells them to prepare for heaven, that we're not going to be here forever, all that they don't want. But why will you come to a church like this and don't want the word of God? And you don't want to measure your life and cleanse your life with the word of the Lord. The reason why you came is that you understand this is the gateway to heaven. And if this is the gateway to heaven, at the gate you must be clean. So check up yourself, you check up your life and see, am I ready? Am I not ready? But it says over here, these are children that will not hear the law of the Lord. See what they say in verse 10. Which say to the seer, see not. And to the prophet, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceit. Deceit deceive us. We don't mind. We just want to be happy. Make us happy. Make us feel excited. Make us feel like we are worth something. Encourage us. Even if you have to misinterpret the Bible, misrepresent the Bible, turn the Bible upside down. We don't care about what to do with the Bible. Just get something out of that Bible and encourage us. Prophesy unto us smooth things. Look at verse 11. Get out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One to cease from before us. As we talk about the Holy One of Israel, the Mighty One of Israel, the High and the Exalted One, and the Trice Holy One, Holy, 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 is the Lord of us. Uh, that makes us afraid. When we think about His holiness, you talk about eternity, you talk about heaven, you talk about holiness, that makes us afraid. Suspend all that now and just talk to us about the situation where we are. Man must eat, man must get married, a woman must get married, and we must have children, we must have healing. All the good, good things you can talk about, talk about that. But as for the Holy One of Israel, let him cease from us. That's how they are in the world. I pray you will not be like that. That's how many of the churches are. They call them Pentecostal churches, charismatic churches, prosperous churches, successful churches, winning churches, whatever they are. But the word of God is now missing in many of those places. I pray the word will not be missing here in Jesus' name. Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. 
you'll see that it even happened to the children of Israel. They forgot the word of God. And what was the result? What was the result when they forgot the word of God? Hosea chapter 4, we're reading from verse, we're reading from verse 6. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. When you lack the knowledge of repentance, the knowledge of restitution, the knowledge of righteousness, the righteousness demanded by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. When you lack the knowledge of sanctification and holiness, whereby it takes your evil nature, your Adamic nature, and your brutes, that's it, and it says, I want you to be like Christ. Don't you know that Jesus did not have any Adamic nature? Don't you know that he didn't have the root of sin? And he wants to produce in you. Let this might be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He wants to give you the heart of Christ, the mind of Christ, the life of Christ. He wants to give you the love of Christ. He wants that to be in you. And But when you don't want that, it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because that was rejected knowledge, I also have rejected thee. That's what happens. If you reject the word of God, then he also rejects you. I will also reject you that thou shalt be no more priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten, forgotten, forgotten the law of thy God, I also will forget thy children. You might say you're say carrying on ministry, children ministry, youth ministry, whatever ministry, but it says when you forget the word of God, all that remains is entertainment. All that remains is just social, uh, social socializing. It says I also will forget your children. I pray you will not forget us. Look at verse 7. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore, when I change their glory into shame. And that's uh, what happens when we forget. Look at verse 9. And there shall be like people, like priests. There shall be like people, like priests. The priest is sinful. The people are sinful. The preacher is a backslider. The people are backsliding. The preacher don't, doesn't measure his life with the word of God. The people cannot measure their lives with the word of God. The preacher, the minister, the pastor, whatever you're calling, is not living according to the word of God. The people will not live according to the word of God. And the preacher is going to perish, he's going to hell, because it's not born again, it's not retaining that holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. The preacher is going to hell. His people are going to hell. It says, verse 9, Therefore shall, there, there shall be like people, like priests, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their doings. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it says, They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills under oaks and and the poplars and the elms. And then it says, because the shadow thereof is good. Therefore, your daughters shall commit order and uh, your spouses shall commit adultery. And that's what takes over their lives. As you think, you know, we're going to church, we're going to, what kind of church are you going? You find adultery rampant there, fornication rampant there. No, and nobody is correcting anybody. How can the pastor correct the people when the pastor himself is committing living in sin with members of the church. I pray that will not happen here in Jesus' name. Amen. Give me a good amen there. Amen. Chapter 7 of uh, chapter 7 of Osea. Osea chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 7. Osea chapter 7, verse 7. They are all hot as an oven, and have devoured their judges, and their kings are falling. They have devoured their judges. And their kings are falling. Look up here for a moment. Why is it that, you know, our own pastors in our local churches, why are they afraid to correct anybody now? Oh, they corrected people before. And they say, I burnt my hands. I, I corrected that person and I wanted him to get to heaven. I said, my friend, this one you're doing will land you in hellfire. Ah, 
You talk to me, you think that I'm just like an honorary member, and then you begin to see some things, maybe in the night, or maybe in the day, oppression and attack and evil, and then some of the friends gang together, and they're attacking you because you wanted the man to get to heaven. You wanted the lady to get to heaven. And you say, I told you that so that if Jesus will come anytime, you will not perish. Leave me alone. Why are you doing that? And because, you know, you see that one is attacked and that one is oppressed and that one is, uh, you know, whatever. And uh, so because of that kind of suffering, the rest of the pastor said, uh -uh, I'm not going to try it again. I know pastor so-and-so, where you see now, his business is rich. His family is scattered and things are bad for him. And it began because he opened his mouth and corrected somebody on his way to hell. If they want to perish, let them perish. I will not correct them anymore. They devour their judges. They devour their pastors. They oppress. They destroy their pastors and their leaders. And those leaders don't have any heart anymore any confidence anymore, any heart to correct anybody. But shh, I pray that the Lord will help you and make you repent if you are like that. I said you repent if you are like that. It's like you're in the aeroplane and, you know, something got in your head and you're going to take the pilot and you throw him outside the window. You're going to die yourself once you throw your pilot out. It's like you're riding a car and that car is at short top speed. And then you go to the driver there and then you hurt him and you do something to him that makes him not to be in control of that car anymore. When the accident happens to yourself, you will die. And if you, you know, send your pastor, I mean your local pastor, you send him packing, he's now afraid, he's timid, he cannot talk. Because he knows that if he talks and tells you to repent and tells you to seek salvation and tells the backslider to come back and seek the face of the Lord, he knows he's going to suffer for it. Not only suffer in months, so he's going to suffer for years. And he doesn't understand that that suffering is nothing in comparison with the suffering in hellfire forever and ever. Therefore, he keeps quiet. If your local pastor keeps quiet, because he's afraid of you, and you remain a backslider, you have hurt yourself, you have destroyed yourself. I pray God will give you understanding. They are all hurt as an oven, and have devouched their judges, and all their kings are falling. There is none among them that calleth unto me a frame. He has mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers have devouched his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, great ears are here and there upon him. Yea, yet he knoweth it not. I pray you will not be like this. It says strangers have devoured their strength, and yet they do not understand. And are still proud. And let us see the result on them. We're looking at chapter 8, verse 3. Chapter 8, verse 3. Um, it says, Israel has cast off the thing that is good. What will happen? Say it aloud. I'm going to read that part again. You read your own part. Israel has cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. What does that mean? Israel has cast off the thing that is good. In the days of Moses, you remember? If anybody, even ordinarily, ordinarily gathering sticks on the Sabbath day, Moses will deal with that. And you remember the time of Moses? If anybody will go against the watch of the Lord, Moses was firm. Moses was very clear. Now Moses is gone. And Joshua took over. At the time of Joshua, there was still a bit of that. Achan did what he did. That way, we a goodly Babylonish garment that came into the camp, and judgment came upon the land of Israel. And then Joshua said, Why has this happened? And God said, Get up on your feet. On your feet, there is sin in the camp, and as long as their constant sin is there, I will not be with you. But Joshua was able to deal with that. But later, as Kings came, 
And at the time of Solomon in particular, he had 300 wives. How many concubines? 700. All together, 1,000. When the king has 1,000 women, if anybody has only seven, only ten, does he have much to talk? Hey, sir, you have 1,000. He only has 12. He only has 15. As the people, the leadership, and they were not living right anymore, they cast off the thing that is good. The law of God was no more there. Tell me, if the pastor has girlfriend in the church, in your local church, and everybody knows, we know that anytime you want to see pastor, so and so, they call her sister, but you know, she's just a Jezebel. And so and so is always in his office. If the pastor is keeping that girlfriend among the choir, girlfriend over there, girlfriend over there, if uh, somebody is backsliding and is uh, having whatever affairs, can the pastor talk? They cast off the thing that is good. No discipline anymore. They cannot talk. If the person that is a worker is stealing money out of the bag as we count, and everybody knows that what work is he doing? He's just doing a manual work. I see right here a cat like this, and people are, don't you know? Don't you know? They count at the altar. And because they count at the altar, that's how they're having that. And he knows that everybody knows. And then you put him there as a leader. What can he say? What can he do? How can he stand? How can he help other people to know that this is the way to hell? He cannot talk. Because he's cast up the thing that is good. And the enemy shall pursue him. And you know, when the enemy pursues him, you pray, you pray, you pray. Nothing will happen. I pray that God will deliver us in Jesus' name. And the way back to God is repentance. The way of repentance and the way of righteousness. Because if we remain in that condition, I'm deeper life, I'm deeper life. Ah, you turn it to a song. You are deeper life. Where is the deepness in your life? How deep is your salvation? How deep is your sanctification? How deep is your honesty and your transparency and your life? That's what God is looking at. It's not just the name. When that name came originally, it was to make us that we are not like every dick and hurry that God did, did in us a deep work of grace. And I pray that that work of grace will be in your life in Jesus' name. And look at verse 12, chapter 8, verse 12. Can you imagine? I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a stranger sin. When you hear sanctification now, that looks strange. When the pastor comes and he preaches holiness without which no man shall save the Lord, that looks strange. One man and one woman until death do us part. That looks strange. And when you say that every adulterer will be judged by the Lord, that's looking, see, it's now sounding strange in their ears. And when the Lord shall come, it's coming for those who are saved and sanctified and purified, ready for the coming of the Lord. It's now strange in their ears. I'm reaching unto them, unto him, the great things of my Lord. But they were counted as a strange thing. And let me show you something. When you come to the New Testament, it's in Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. And see what Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, and I'm reading here from verse 13. Mark chapter 7, from verse 13. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such things ye do. You know, you can still keep the format of the church and the form of service. And you can still keep all the, you know, this follows this and this follows that. You can still keep, you know, we have Sunday service. We we'll start with this. We'll come on with this. We'll come on with this. And then you go through everything. And looking at you outwardly, you're still there. But the traditions, they eat up. The real vitality and the heart of the word. And Jesus said, you Pharisees, worshippers. That you keep all these traditions and the word of God now 
is without effect. Look at that again. Making the word of God of what? Of none effect. Doesn't affect the sinner. We come in as sinners, we go away as sinners. Doesn't affect the backslider. We come in as backsliders, we go back as backsliders. We can attend retreat and conference and crusade and whatever. We're members of deeper life. And there's no change in our lives. It makes the word of none effect through your tradition. And if the traditions are making the word of God of none effect, check up and say, look at the result of God's forgotten word. This tradition is eating up the effect of the word in our lives. Sinners are not repenting. People who say they are believers, they are not making restitution. A lot of bad, bad things, evil things in their lives, they cannot go to the people they have offended. I am sorry. Violence, wickedness, fighting, discord, disagreement, conflict in their lives and in their families and are still coming to church. They make the word of none effect by tradition. Is that the only way to make the word of God of none effect? Look at Second Corinthians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 17. Second Corinthians, I'm reading from chapter 2 verse 17. You make the word of none effect in another way here now. In verse 17 of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, But we are not as many that corrupt the word of God. We are not as many that corrupt the word of God. Those Pharisees, they made the word of God of non effect through tradition. These ones, they make the word of God of non effect through misinterpretation misinterpretation. They take the word of God like this and what it says is very clear that will bring conviction on the sinner. They distort it and they misinterpret it. By distortion and misinterpretation, then they make that word of non effect. The convicting power in the word of God is taken away because they have distorted it. And look at another thing. I want you to look at uh, Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, and I'm reading from verse 18. Revelation chapter 22, we're reading from verse 18. It says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone, any man, shall add unto these things, and God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. There are people who make the word of God of none effect by addition. Addition. You know, they will read the word of God and leave it like that. Then they add other things and say other things. Sweet, sweet. We read the message from our pastor, Pastor W.F. Kumoye, the general representative of the Palais Bible Church. It is my wish that as you listen, you will accept the old word and you will let them sink into the, your hearts. And by the grace of the Lord, you will never regret it. It is my prayer that by next week, when our pastor shall come up again to present another message, you will be there, your family will be there, and your friends. And I believe as you are listening to the message every week, by the grace of the Lord, you will never be the same. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, O oh Lord, because of today's message. We thank you, O oh Lord, because of the one you let us listen to last week and the one we are going to listen to the next week by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. If we tarry, we shall listen together once again next week. And if not, every one of us will be there with you in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because you are the Lord that answers prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.